We just have a lot to get through. And um, so the next segment of this um, symposium is about Unseen Tears, the Native American Boarding School Experience in Western New York. And it's a documentary film directed by Brian Douglas, who when I was actually doing um, curating for, and so we walked, and I talked to Pete Hill. Pete Hill told me I had to watch this documentary. So it's all your fault, Pete, that we're seeing it today. <laughs> and then that'll be followed by uh, a panel conversation with Doug George and Pete Hill, and Ansley Jemison is going to facilitate that conversation. Um, and so let's start the screening of Unseen Tears. song that was counting dead Indians uh, back on the trails when they would kill Indians. You'd see all these little kids in uniform and we'd be wondering how come they're like that. We weren't dressed like that, but these little kids were. I remember being younger, growing up on the reservation and being told, don't trust white people, don't listen to them. You never told why. The government schools are constantly being built and hospitals added. We bring them in clean them up, and start them on their way to civilization. I would ask social services and human services audience, how many people know about residential boarding schools? How many people here do? This never makes it into the history books. This is never talked about. Why did those schools get started, and who started them, and what was the rationale behind it? And the first general policy was the only good Indian was a dead Indian, that we needed to be killed, exterminated, eradicated. 
Um, once they realize that's a little bit more difficult to do is to have mass genocide of a population, the policies change to, from killing to killing the Indian and saving the man. There's a general Pratt who is well famous and documented for using those words to kill the Indian and save the man and that we are subhuman and that our ways are savage and we need to be civilized. Well, in the governments in Canada and the United States follow that policy up until the, the 1980s in one form or another. There is a boarding school far, far away where we get mush and milk for three times a day. Oh, how the huskies run when they hear their dinner bell. Oh, how the huskies run three times a day. Like I say, I went to the mush hall when I was four years old. I was there for nine years. And uh, once in a while we'd come home on in summertime, but not all the time. When the counselors came and told my dad that he couldn't raise us properly, we were at the mush hall one week and our heads were full of bugs. Well, there was a lot of sad times, but I mean, like, I didn't get, like, angry and have any resentment until after I got out. Because I didn't know, like, uh, from just from five and a half to 16, they just thought it was just like a normal upbringing. Like, they not have no parents and stuff like that. Right. So that's... Uh, and after I got out, and then they thought, well, this is the way they were supposed to be uh, treating us. I think my mother couldn't take care of us because uh, our father was uh, into alcohol. Me and my sister, we started there in 1945. I was five years old at the time. We had all our hair cut off. We were made baldies. We were really bald. And uh, that wasn't a very good feeling to have. And uh, they used to call us the uh, mush hole baldies. That's what they used to, the kids on the reserve used to call us. Oh, well, we can go in now. I mean, this is going to take like all day, eh? Dude. <laughs> <laughs> We were taken to the hospital to get checked out for uh, nits and whatever, I guess that was, you know. Uh, well, they checked us out, you know. Then, you know then, then they split us. The, the school was split in age group and by the boys and girls. Boys were on one side, the girls were on one side. And they went from the lower age up to uh, high school level. My mom was gonna walk out here and go out this door. And, uh, and at five and a half, I, uh, my sister tells me that I grabbed my mom's leg and uh, you know, of course we were all just crying. We were, the whole four of us were just crying. Like, you know, because uh, my mom was gonna leave us here. So I, I grabbed my mom's leg and, uh, well, crying and that and, uh, uh, just kind of like uh, hollering like, Ma, don't leave me, don't leave me, like, you know, so. But anyway, like, uh, while that was going on, like, the supervisor came over and just kind of grabbed me and took me off my Ma's leg, and, uh, and then my Ma just walked out, and I'd never seen her uh, for those ten, ten years that I was here. She never come to see me once. I don't know why. He took my brother away to where he was supposed to stay. And my sister, she just went on her own. I was with most of the four, year, four and five year olds. We didn't go to school because we were too young. Yet, through the agencies of the government, they are being rapidly brought from their state of comparative savagery and barbarism the one of civilization. When we used our language, we, at that young age too, you know, we were just learning. So uh, they used to wash our mouth out with soap. They would take the whole bunch of us and march us to the uh, shower, coal shower, and they'd throw us in there and beat us along the way. And that was a routine thing, I guess, I don't know. but. That, uh, ta that taught us, you know. They'd throw us in this dark press room where they kept all our Sunday go-to-meeting clothes, and uh, they'd throw Rosemary and I in there and uh, tell us the rats were going to get us. 
but uh, I didn't know then why I was being thrown in there, and I used to wonder, what did I do? And uh, I would cry, and Rosemary would cry, and we cried and cried for hours in there, not knowing why we were in there. And uh, they'd take us out. And when I did get to learn a little bit of English, I knew then they were throwing us in there because we wouldn't speak English. And uh, I must have been stubborn right from the day I was born because I thought to myself, I'll never speak English either. You want me to speak English? I won't speak English. So I didn't speak at all for two whole years because I figured if I spoke Indian, I could lick him. And uh, if I spoke English, then it would be against everything that I stood for. And so I didn't speak at all. But today they all speak English and some have taken business courses, home economics, and other higher training. Took us into another room down there, and maybe down in the playroom. We took all our clothes off and we put the, uh, the clothes of the school on. Yeah, and they give us a number. So my number was like 48, and my brother was uh, 36. My family was the state-run institute. And the nickname for the Thomas Indian School is Salem. And Salem was derived from asylum. And you know what an asylum is. It's for crazy people. So we were thought of as being crazy, I guess. They were just considered bad people, bad children, but they weren't bad children, okay? They were placed there for, for so many different reasons, but not because of any kind of delinquency um, on their part. But that is not how they were treated. We went from, from uh, washing up in the morning and they marched us to the chow hall where we ate. Everything was routine, just like the military. One of the superintendents during the time that my mother was there actually came from uh, correctional services. And so, because that person came with that kind of a, um, uh, a background in corrections and working in penitentiaries, that's exactly how he decided that Thomas Indian School would be operated. Children marched from here to there, just everything, you know, had its place. I talked to some of the, the men who went there. I would say majority of them went into the military. Military life was easy for them. They knew how to do all the marching, they knew how to line up, they knew how to dress with their uniforms, everything being exact, making the bed in a military style. They knew all that before they went into the military. I was in A Division, my sister was in B Division. A whole lot of things that happened. Things that I can remember when I was six years old, this man chased uh, Rosemary and I from Mohawk Park because they took us all on an outing when it was time to come home. This man called us into the gazebo, and told Rosemary and I that he had something for us, and that's where he tried to molest us, and we ran. And even now, I, I have nightmares of uh, running. But my brother, he ran away after being here about five years. They never caught him, so. He said, that we were really bad and we were born of the devil. And if we told anybody what he was doing, they wouldn't believe us anyway. And that's so true, because when he did, I think, uh, I think he had penetrated me that time. And uh, I was bleeding and I was sore. And I went and I told the nurse. And she asked me what happened, so I told her. And she gave me a strapping, a real good strapping. And she told me, don't you ever speak about him like that again. She said, he would never do anything like that to you. So there I was again, getting another licking. And uh, like now when I think about all the things that happened, I said, you're damned if you did and damned if you didn't, no matter which way you got a licking. And it, it just wasn't, just, just wasn't right. And I remember this person telling me that any of the boys in his particular dormitory floor who were not circumcised yet at that point, without being told, were marched over to the infirmary. And if they weren't circumcised by then, they were circumcised. And if they 
didn't have their tonsils out by then, they, they had their tonsils removed. And I just couldn't imagine uh, from his story uh, how this could take place, number one. Um, and number two, back in those times, on the late 40s and early 50s, they didn't have air conditioning like we had. And just the whole trauma of, of that personal invasion. We were always having a physical. And then, like I said, if you had a hangnail, you had to go see the doctor. And if you got caught sitting on the ground or holding hands with the boy, you had to go see the doctor. Um, they were all the time checking to make sure that everybody was a virgin. So in the summertime when we went out to work, he would give us a physical. And then when he came back, we'd get the physical. I said, and you better come back with everything that you left. You know, you should, he wanted to know if you had intercourse or not, you know. And, um, but every th little thing, the uh, sexual, they were always checking on us, you know. Yeah, they had you scared, but one girl thought, one girl thought that you got pregnant just holding hands. They had shop on the, on this floor here, then uh, home economics on the t uh, above. Yeah, so I had my tonsils out, and I can remember trying to fool them. They used to put us to sleep with the ether, so they put a mask over us and we'd be tied down and they'd pour that ether over our nose right like this and wait a while and you'd have to inhale that, you know? And then they'd put some more on there again until you actually fell asleep from the ether. And um, then they'd take your tonsils out. And there's the hospital over there. You wanna get up closer? It's... Yeah. I, I spent a year in that building, the hospital. And then we always laughed about, there was a head in there, he had in a bottle. <laughs> We'd show everybody that got admitted to the hospital. You want to see the head in there? It was, it was in a jar. He'd saved. Uh, uh, appendix two were saved. He had them in a little bottle. So you want your appendix back? <laughs> you know, they, they, they save those. Just kept getting one thing right after the other. I had infection in my ear. Then I had whooping cough, mumps, measles. You name it, I had it. And uh, I had no help with my schoolwork. I ended up failing. My brother uh, was in uh, sick there, and they said he just had a cough and a cold. And uh, they would never let my father go out to see him. So one day my father came and he told the nurse he was going up to see his son and there was nothing she could do to stop him. And she said that she would call the principal. And he told her, call the principal. He pushed her out of the way and he went up. He says when he got up there, the stench was so bad he couldn't even hardly breathe. And uh, he went in and there was my brother. The principal came running up after him, telling him to leave. And he told the principal, he said, if you don't want to go down those stairs, he said, you better leave. He says, and you better call the ambulance. So they called an ambulance and the ambulance came. My brother was in Branford General Hospital for six months. He had pleurisy and uh, he was there for six months. Then he was transferred to Lady Wellington Hospital in Oshwegan for three more months. When he came out of the hospital, he was so weak he couldn't even hold a pencil. And uh, he just never ever really got better. He died an alcoholic. What we see and the people we work with, there is multi-generational alcoholism in a lot of the families that we've worked with. And we do de genealogy charts usually with the family to find out who their family is and what their resources might they might have. And we do find that some of the uh, parents or grandparents that they had were in boarding schools. I would like to share with you my part of my childhood and the effects boarding school has had on me. Uh, my father attended the Thomas Indian School. My grandfather went to Carlisle. My mother and father were both in a boarding school and my uh, Father was married before he married my mother, so he had two children, and they were sent away to 
uh, boarding school. So uh, I might say two generations there were in boarding school. My mother was went to Thomas Indian School, and uh, my uh, father was at Carlisle, which was in uh, Pennsylvania. We all pound the wand and make soup together. I just want to grab a picture of my mom. She had an Indian name, and the name that she had was to be a faith keeper's name. When she came out of that school, she couldn't speak a lick of Seneca. You can see the difficulty in um, when the families try to parent their children, that uh, the lack of bonding with their children, um, some anger, you know, as a matter of fact, there's a lot of anger and alcoholism. So those are some things that I see on a regular basis from families that uh, had a relative or parent or grandparent who were in boarding schools. I was ready for bed. Mom made Daddy get me up. I thought I was already ready for school. Okay? Got me up and cut all my hair up to a bump right below my ear. She cut about that much. That was the last time I was allowed long hair. That's abuse. And that was standard practice at the morning school. Yeah, everybody went through that one. Everyone, you see? But that was another thing. We don't know carryover. if that was a carryover. We don't know. She was trained to be a domestic. She learned the art of physical punishment. With the harsh punishment, you have a lot of domestic violence. Um, when, when a child is constantly defending themselves from the rest of the world, they cannot grow emotionally because they're always defending themselves against whatever is coming at them. When I started going to school down there, it was a, it was a good thing because I got to hang around with the people I, I got to play with all day long. But then they try to teach us this stuff that we don't know anything about. At the time, I, at, I knew the language pretty well. I grew up with Seneca language. I got my hands hit a lot for, the, for, for doing it, and I got to paddle a lot for doing it. But in second grade, Mrs. Cooley had us do a play. And we all had a great time with that play. And the play she chose was Little Black Sambo. And none of us really had been exposed to black people before, you know, so we didn't know any difference, you know. So we put on the Little Black, black Sambo uh, play. And uh, when she picked the cast, um, she picked the uh, she told us this too. She picked the person in the room uh, that was of the darkest skin to play Sambo. And, um, and we all had our part. So it's, it was a very, I guess, subtle way to, to begin that whole teaching about, about um, racism, you know, and who is and who isn't, and the way we feel about people that are different than ourselves. So. And it, and it kind of got, you know, built in at a, at a really young age. When I began to search out why I did the things that I did, then I began begin to understand what my father went through. I can remember my mother kind of ran our household like an institution. We had our daily chores, weekly chores posted to the refrigerator each week. We had to make our beds like in, in military style. That's exactly how she taught us. Everything was just prim and proper to the ironing, all of that. But it was almost in the same structure that she learned and she adopted in the only way that she knew how as a resident of a boarding school. Have we passed some of that on to our children? Yes, I think so. Is there going to be a point in time where our children's children will, will begin to move away from some of that? I, I think so. Because I think in part of the healing um, that our families and our communities are going through, and actually looking at um, some of this impact and being able to talk about it in a good and healthy way and to understand and to reflect not in a negative way helps us just to move beyond that and to try and get back a lot that we lost. So 
So I'm just here today to look for that healing. I'm not looking for anything else. And I am looking to forgive. I forgave my mother, but I want to. I want to forget Thomas Indian School because I know in my heart that my mother did the best she could by me. You know, she wasn't to blame. She had an institution that was her parent. Kids were taken from here and sent to boarding schools like that. I mean, they would take young children, I'd say five, six years old, and send them. That's hard on a child. That's they changed their way of life, you'd say, by doing that. They were used to living here, I mean. Everybody knows that, and everybody that really lived here, I don't think they could move from here. Nobody said anything. But I come down here so I can talk about my father, because I'm proud of him. I'm proud of the life that he led, and that he did the best he could with me and my, my sister and my brother. How long will it take us to really get back the whole idea of what a family is? What, what um, you know, father, mother, son, daughter, what, what does that bond mean? And not only just that, but even extending out to your extended family. Because these children, even if they didn't have parents, if they were truly orphaned, or if they had parents who truly couldn't take care of them, what happened to the extended family? That was also cut. Uh, you know, that's the point of it. We were only native people, so, you know, yeah, so they let that stuff go. So it would take a long time to undo and I can't say that it would ever happen. Because to heal, the apology from the government that allowed this to happen, I would say would never apologize. And who, what, what, uh, What good would a hollow apology be? That's how I look at it. For an apology would have to be sincere. And how could it be sincere if it came from a guy that never went through that experience? Or was the one behind it? It was before their time that it started. So how could they be apologi apologetic towards what they did to us? Hearing what he suffered through was a tough pill to swallow. I mean, he was a five-year-old boy, a little boy. Imagine your five-year-old being taken away from you. Or you at five years old being taken away from your mother. I mean, how would you feel? I couldn't imagine being taken away from my mom and dad at five years old. I would have never let it happen. I would have fought.